Thank you very much, Brother Benton. Uh, our speaker uh, this evening is Brother Anthony Booker, and he's been preaching the gospel for over 50 years, and he's currently the pulpit preacher for the Bird Street Church in Shelbyville, Tennessee. He's married to uh, Sister Ira Booker, and they have six sons, and as he terms it, four not daughters-in-law, but daughters in love. And then God has blessed them with 18 grandchildren and one great-grandson. That's a lot of blessing uh, right there. Um, that's wonderful. Um, he is a graduate of uh, MTSU, uh, David Lipscomb University, and the Nashville School of Preaching. And he is uh, very well respected. And I first was able to meet him at the Tennessee State Lectures and uh, just have really enjoyed getting to know him and his wife uh, since. And so I am going to turn it over to Brother, I, um, excuse me, Brother Anthony Booker as he speaks to us on United in Humility, 1 Corinthians 4. First of all, let me say good evening. good evening. Now, you all can do better than that. The more you talk back to me, the shorter I preach. Good evening. Good evening. That's better. First of all, let me apologize. My wife not able to be with us. She was on program to be with the ladies this week in the old ladies program, but uh, she was not able to make it because uh, she had been very busy. She had a very busy schedule. She's all over the country, so she just couldn't take off to be here this week. So she did tell me to apologize to you ladies because she could not be with you all this week. Maybe next year she'll be able to be with uh, you all. I'm going to assume, and I know it's, it's a danger in assumption. Matter of fact, I preached a sermon one time entitled The Dangers of Assumption. But I'm going to assume tonight that the instruction that was given to Brother Knight this morning also goes for me. And the Brother Knight wanted to know if he could move. He was a walking preacher. And he was informed he need to stay behind the mic. So I'm going to assume that I don't need to be walking tonight. And that I'm going to try my best to stay behind uh, the mic. Now, I know this is a lectureship. I understand that. But I'm a preacher, Will. And I hope I don't offend anyone if I just start preaching tonight. Now, will I offend anybody? Well, all right, I, I'm gonna try to lecture, but preaching is just in me. When you've been doing it as long as I have, it just comes up out of me. Brother Andrew, appreciate your lesson. I understood every word you said. I, I don't know what Will is talking about trying to teach you English. I, I understood every word you said tonight. Appreciate your lesson. Now, you did scare me because my text is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And when you read verse 6, I said, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to reach back and get something else tonight. But you didn't deal with what I have. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles tonight, and I pray you have them, join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6 and verse number 7. You got it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, say wait a minute. 
And if you ain't got your Bible, go home and get it. First Corinthians chapter number four. Verses number six and verse seven. It's where we will take our thought tonight. We will launch from this particular passage tonight. Now, you did notice I say we will launch from here. Ain't no telling where we'll end up, but we're going to start right here. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, says, and these things, brethren, I have a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And if thou didst receive it, why doest thy glory as if thou hadst not received it? Don't y'all just like King James? Amen. What Paul is going to do, he's going to explain why he had spoken of himself and Apollos in this manner. He wanted the Corinthians to react appropriately to human leadership in the church. Not by taking pride in some association with a leader, but by humbly serving one another. Now, if the Corinthians would live under the authority of the scriptures, they would not take pride in one man over another, damaging the fellowship and causing division. If you are a superior person and a man who is fit to teach others, the question is, from where did you get this superiority? If you differ from common people, who makes you to differ? If you are a person of remarkable gifts, how did you come about to possess them? It's all your distinguishing abilities or gifts from God. Why do you boast, Paul asks? Why do you exalt? yourself what have you which you have not received now if you have received it and received everything you have as a gift of divine charity why he asks do you glory as if you did not receive it. Now these are important questions that Paul is 
is addressing to the church at Corinth. So our text tonight contains within it a great and comprehensive truth. And what is that truth? That truth is whatever advantages or anything that you and I possess over our fellow man, we have received it from God. I like what James says. For James says in James 1 and verse number 17, James says every good gift comes down from the Father above. And he says that in whom there is no variance, neither is there any shadow of turning. All he says, everything that you and I have comes from God. Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 17 Paul said, be not high-minded. Don't be proud, he says. The living God has given you everything richly, he says, to enjoy. Even in Acts chapter 17 and the verses number 25, it said that he has given to us all life and breath and all things, everything that we have, everything that is not sinful, everything that we have, it actually came from God. And what Paul is going to do is hope what I can get all of us to see tonight, that there's no big eyes and little U's in the church. Whatever you have, whatever you possessed, whatever degree you have, whatever amount of money you have, no matter what kind of car you drive or house you live in, Paul said, you got it from God. You didn't get it from yourself. I've heard some folks say, what I have, I worked for it. Matter of fact, I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And I'm thinking, who gave you the boots? <laughs> who gave you the straps? It was God. So God has given us everything that we have. Now to prove his point, Paul is going to ask if they had anything that they had not received. The Corinthians had many good gifts in their church. And these gifts come from the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to deal with all of those because Drew did an excellent job this morning talking about the manifestation of the gifts. And he mentioned all those gifts there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The church at Corinth had a lot of gifts. They had the gift of wisdom. They had the gift of knowledge. They had the gift of miracles. They had the gift of prophecy. They had the gift of discernment. They had the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues. So the church at Corinth was blessed to have the gifts that they had. But Paul is saying, even though you have those gifts, don't you think you any better than anyone else? And just because you have the gift of tongues, don't put down the person that only have the gift of prophecy. 
He said every gift was given to you and I and those at Corinth as God saw fit. And if God saw fit to give you one gift and give me another, that's God's doing. And if God gave me something that he didn't give you and gave you something that he didn't give me, he gave it to us for a reason. And the reason is, is so that the whole church, the whole body can operate and function the way it ought to be. If all of us had the same gifts, then some of us would be unnecessary. But God has given us those gifts, those who recognize that they have nothing apart from God's grace, never raise themselves up over others as the Corinthians were doing and causing fraction. Another way to translate this first question, these theoretical questions that Paul is asking, he's simply asking us that we need to come to God and we need to realize that everything we have come from God. You are not superior to anyone else. No one has made you superior to others. No one has given you a higher status than others. Who maketh you to differ, Paul says, meaning differ so that you have the advantage over someone else? Who in the world gave you this difference is what he's asking. Now, that's my introduction. Now my time starts. 1 Corinthians 4, verse number 7. Paul says, and as I look at this, in, when he begins in verse 7, he looks at several other passages and I want to look at several other passages about pride tonight. And all of these passages that I'm going to use contrast pride with something. They show something that is opposite of pride. And I want you to see that each and each case the opposite of pride is humility. For my subject tonight is unity in humility. Unity in humility. The opposite of boasting is humility. Recognizing the truth that our distinctive abilities are gifts from God. The Corinthians were caught up in playing one person's strength against another person's strength. That's why it says in chapter 1 and verse 12 that some were saying, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos and I am of Cephas and I am of Christ. They were putting one against another. And Paul is going to deal with that attitude. He said this kind of boasting in man would be impossible if you really understood and savored the truth of the abilities and the gifts that God has given you. So the first way to battle pride is to get a very clear biblical truth 
and then rest in that truth and enjoy it. God gives us our power. So let him who boasts, boast in God and not in man. We must be careful that we don't allow others to put us on a pedestal. And I know sometimes, especially as preachers, we will allow members to ascribe to us a position that where we get the big head and we begin to think we better than anybody else. You can find yourself in serious trouble when you get to that place. Who gave you that? Where did you get it from? I am only what I am by the grace of God. And I pray that I never, ever forget that. That wherever I go, whatever I say, whoever I meet, I want you to know that I'm no better than you. I'm just a gospel preacher. You may be the, the bank president. That don't make you no better than me. And because I'm the preacher, don't make me no better than you. Paul wants the Corinthians to see and understand where did you get that power? Who gave it to you? How did you receive it? The questions that Paul is asking the church at Corinth is so they would understand everything they have comes from God. And I don't care how hard you may work. I don't care what school you go to. I don't care what degree you may have behind your name. Don't make you no better than me. Oh, I may have a third grade education, but God may have given me something that he haven't given you with all of your college degrees. Now, I'm not knocking school, Andrew. Don't, don't you quit and say, Brother Booker said, I ain't got to go this last month. Don't, don't, don't you quit. I've been to four schools. So I know the value of education. I know the value of being trained. But don't you ever get to the point that you think you are so much better than everybody else. Because the only way you got what you have is because God gave it to you. Oh, you put in a lot of sweat equity. You burn a lot of midnight oil. I understand that. And it wasn't all will doing everything for you. It ain't him. It's God. I got it because God gave it to me. And that's what Paul is trying to get the church at Corinth to see. I like what James says. James says in James 4, verses 6 through 8, James says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But then he said, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, the opposite of pride here is submitting to God and drawing near to God. People that suffer from pride are people that want to be independent. People that want not only to be independent, but they want to pull their own strings. They want to be their own person. 
when you get to the point that you want to pull your own strings and, and you want to be independent. You don't want to have nothing to do with nobody else. You may be suffering from pride because a humble person don't respond like that. Humble person don't act like that. You see, James says in 4 verses 13, he said, go now and say today, tomorrow, we'll go into such a city and we'll continue there for a year. We're going to buy and get and we're going to sell. But notice what James says. He says, wherefore, you know not what shall be on tomorrow. For what is your life? For it is just a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then it vanishes away. For what you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do this and we'll do that if we live. But now, James says, you rejoice in your boasting. And such boasting, James says, is evil. What do you mean, James? You mean to tell me when I say I'm going to do this on tomorrow. I'm going to do this on Friday. I'm going to do this next week. James says, you ought not say that. Because you don't know if you're going to be alive on Friday. What's really happening is you suffering from pride because pride says, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do this Friday. Don't you know God can snatch your very breath right out of you at any moment? That's why it behooves us to be humble. The way of boasting shows itself in this text through our unbelief and the sovereignty of God over the ordinary things of life. James says that not believing in the sovereign rights of God to run your life results in a life of arrogance. I'm going to trust him. And the way I'm going to stay humble is to yield to the sovereignty of God in all of my life, in all of the details of my life, I'm going to rest in his awesome ability to work those things out in my life. Peter puts it this way. First Peter 5, verses 5 through 7. Peter says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. Yea, all of you submit, he said, be subject to one another. Peter says, you and I have a responsibility to be subject to each other. The word subject who potassio literally means that you got to throw yourself under, but it carries more than that. It literally means you volunteer to throw yourself under one another. That's what humility is all about. So Peter says, be subject one to another. And then he uses this, and be clothed with humility be clothed with humility in other words just like I put this coat on Peter says Anthony instead of putting the coat on here's what I want you to do I want you to clothe yourself put on humility you put on humility. Cover yourself with humility. 
Clothe yourself. That word clothe actually comes from the Greek word that we literally get that of a apron that a slave would put on. This word clothe refers to the apron that the slave would put on before she would go and serve. That's what Paul has in mind. You clothe yourself, wrap yourself. You remember in John 13 when Jesus washed the disciples' feet? You remember he took the towel and guess what he did? He wrapped it around him, clothed himself. That's what Peter is trying to get us to see. He says, humble yourself. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. We need to realize that God would do the exalting. I don't have to exalt myself. I don't have to try to put myself on a pedestal. I don't have to pat myself on the back. Oh, yes, I love encouragement. But I know something about encouragement. When you've been preaching 52 years, you will know folks will throw palm leaves in your path one day. And the very next day they say, crucify him. Crucify him. So I understand that you got to stay humble. God will do the exalting. He will lift you up. If there is no humility in our fellowship, our fellowship is superficial and our fellowship will be stifled. Pride will lurk at our door and we will become a self-deceived, sick church when we allow pride to take over. Jeremiah says this, Jeremiah 13, 15, 16. Hear ye and give ear and be not proud for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he calls darkness, before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while you look for light, He'll be there and you only see the shadow of death and make the darkness gross. He said, be not proud. Give glory to the Lord your God. See, the opposite of pride is giving God the glory. Jeremiah also says, Jeremiah 9, verse 22 through 24, he said, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty glory in his might. Not let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him glory, glory in this. What should I glory in? He said, you glory in that you know and you understand God, that I am the Lord and I'm the one that exercised judgment and kindness and righteousness in the earth. And these things you ought to delight in, saith the Lord. Jeremiah says, if you're going to ever defeat pride in your life, you have got to learn to make God the God of everything. Glory in this, that you know God. If you want to boast in your intellect, let me encourage you. Glory in God. If you want to boast in your strength, glory in God. You want to glory in your beauty? Glory in God. 
if you want to brag on your estate, then let me encourage you, brag on God. I don't know if you ever bragged on God or not, but most of us never have literally bragged on my God because I know what my God can do. Webster defines humble like this, not proud, nor haughty, not arrogant or assertive. He said it means having and showing modest or low estate for one's own importance. People often talk about their humbling experience, but humble and humiliation is not the same. See, being humiliated is not the same as being humble. Humbleness is who you are. Humiliation is what you feel. So let us learn to be humble. Humility is directly related to our ability and willingness to learn. It is important for you and I to stay humble every day of our lives. C.S. Lewis says this, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. I'm just going to give God all the glory. So as I close tonight, now I'm not finished, but I'm going to close. I want to read you a passage because if you want to be humble, let me encourage you to follow the example of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, I want to begin with verse number 1. Philippians 2, 1 says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Let not every man on his own, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I tell couples that when me and my wife do premarital counseling, I tell the couple, I said, I can tell you a lot about marriage. I've been married over 40, about 42 years. And I say, I could tell you a lot. And I can give you all kind of scriptures that deal with marriage. But I'm only going to give you one. And if you just do this one, you'll be all right. But what is it, Brother Boy? Because everybody thinks I can do one. I give them this one right here. Let nothing. You know what nothing means? Nothing. Nada. Not. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, here's what I want you to do. I want you to esteem him better than you. And I want you to esteem her better than you. And I don't want you to look on your own things. But I want you to look on the things of the other person. Now you want to have a successful marriage? That's the key right there. Do nothing through vain glory, through strife. And you always push 
your spouse out front because you're not thinking of you. And she's always pushing you out front because she's not thinking of her. And if both of you do that, you're going to make it. Not saying you're going to have no problems, but you're going to make it. But he says, verse 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made of himself no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion of uh, the man. Guess what? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You remember, there was two guys in Mark chapter 10 named James and John. They came to Jesus and they asked Jesus a question. They wanted to know. They said, Master, can you give us what we desire? Now, Mark says that they asked Jesus. But when you read Matthew's account in Matthew 20, it says that their mother asked Jesus. It really doesn't matter which one it is because Jesus is going to talk to James and John. He said, what is it that you want? They say, what we want is that when you sit on your throne, if you would let one of us sit on the left and let the other one sit on the right, Jesus says, you don't even know what you asked him. Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? They said, yes, we can. But Jesus said, but to sit on your right hand, sit on my left hand, that's really not mine to give. The Father give that to who it is prepared for. But I want you to notice verse number 42. Jesus called the rest of the disciples together because they had a problem with James and John asking for that position. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus said, you know, they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But here's verse 43. But it's not so with you all. Not so among you. He said, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the son of man didn't come to be ministered unto, but he came to minister. He didn't come for others to serve him. He came to be a servant. If you want to be humble, and I pray that as a church, we will be united in humility that all of us recognize our position. All of us recognize who we are. And we are humble in serving one another. Even the disciples says they want to be great. Can we be great? And Jesus says, you want to be great? I show you how to be great. And he called a little child unto him. And he says this in Matthew chapter 18. 
He said, if you want to be great, you first must come like a little child because this child, Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you must humble yourself and become as a little child. So let me ask you tonight, I don't know where you're from. I don't know what congregation you with, but I know you from probably different parts of the state and even out of the state. I want you to go home and I want you to be the one that will start and letting that church know that we're going to be united, not only in doctrine, but we're going to be united in humility. Because we now realize that all of us are in the same boat. No big eyes and little U's. But you got to be humble tonight. And if you're not part of the body of Christ, you need to be. You need to come to Jesus. If you're not part of his church, you need to be tonight. We're going to sing a song in a little bit. And the purpose of that song is to just kind of boost you, encourage you. Now, I do understand that a song is not really going to make up your mind to obey God. I understand that. The Holy Spirit must tug on your heart. For no man can come to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. I understand. But I also know Satan probably whispered in your ear. And he's telling you, you don't have to do it tonight. You can wait till tomorrow. Wait till Sunday. How do you know? You're going to be alive come Sunday. Tell me. Tell me. How do you know? For certain, you're going to be alive come Sunday. You've been watching television lately, hadn't you? All these folk getting killed and shot for no apparent reason. Just turning around in a driveway, get shot. Walk up to the wrong car, get shot. Go up, knock on the wrong door, get shot. You don't know where death is. Psalm said, there's only a step between me and death. It may be the next step I take. It may be the next step you take. But we're going to sing a song encouraging you. And if you are here tonight and you've been one of those individuals that you've been, you have thought it was all about you and then some, You've been thinking you was all of this and a bag of chips. You haven't been humble. You need to get it right tonight. Because we all need to leave here united in humility. If you need to respond to the invitation, why not do it right now and we together stand?